and other similar chairs have been established across the UK and outside the UK violate the basic principles of academic freedom and inquiry. Why are these chairs, for instance, chairs of Israeli studies rather than chairs in Middle Eastern studies? Why are they chairs not in Palestinian studies, given that that is the geographical name for the territory, <coughs> if not the political name, that goes by the name these days of Israel? Or at least why are they not chairs in the Palestine-Israel conflict rather than simply chairs of Israeli studies? What then are the aims of these chairs or research areas, or the research areas associated with the chairs that have been established? And why, in the case of Sussex, is it named after this man, who may well be a hero in Israel, but is also arguably, from the outside, somebody who, dispassionately one might say, is at least open to the charge, if not guilty of the charge, of something that today would be be called nefarious activities, if not literally, war crimes. And who controls the appointment of the chair? How is the chair selected? And who is the panel, or who sits on the panel? What is the composition of the panel that selects the chair? These, I think, are the key questions that we have to ask about this chair, but also about similar chairs up and down the country. And Sussex, of course, is not alone in this, and I will come back to make reference to other such appointments that have been made. Since 2009, across the UK, there have been a number of such chairs, all of them, without exception, funded by external sources, not on the basis of funding that the university already had at its disposal. The claim that I want to make tonight, um, and this may surprise some of you, is not that this is in any way improper. And I'm sure that those of you who are, many of you who came along here tonight expect me to say that it was. I want to claim something slightly different. I want to claim that all of the circumstantial evidence that surrounds the establishment of this chair and that surrounds the appointment process and the aims and objects of the research center that's associated with it, all that circumstantial evidence indicates the possibility of impropriety. And the failure of the University of Sussex, and particularly of its Vice-Chancellor, to answer the obvious questions, some of which I put to you at the beginning, failure to answer despite being asked by staff and students to give answers to these questions, reinforces the concern that suggests that this may be a major problem of academic impropriety. Subtending that concern, arguably must be seen as part of an Israeli state propaganda initiative that operates under the name of Hasbara, a meaning I'm given to understand in modern Hebrew of explanation, or to put it more forcefully, public relations. In other words, the Hasbara initiative established to try to divert the world's attention and to alter its perception of Israel as a state indelibly associated with such things as guns and warfare, dead children, demolished houses, drone-led assassinations, phosphorus bombs, and <coughs> other similar war crimes crimes and to shift attention from that to the idea of the Israeli state as actually a center uh, for dem democracy, freedom, uh, plurality, etc. And in Britain, the Hasbara in initiative itself, led <laughs> by the British Israeli Research and Academic Exchange Center, jointly established in the UK by supporters in the UK and by the Israeli government and supported itself by the Pierce Foundation and the United Jewish Israel Appeal. BIRAX, this British Israel Research and Academic Exchange, was itself facilitated by one of the key movers in the establishment 
of the Chair of Israeli Studies at the University of Sussex, Lord Weidenfeld, a former Chief of Cabinet of Israel. Barak's attempts to strengthen research cooperation between Israeli and British academics, especially and notably as a means for countering the growing mood across the world and in the UK, not just amongst academics and students, but more wider than that as well, for a boycott of Israeli institutions and particularly of Israeli academic institutions complicit, as those in favour of the boycott suggest that they are, in the illegal occupation of Palestine, in the historical justification of the State of Israel and its oppressions, and in the continuation of the discrimination against the Palestinian population inside Israel. And in that sense, what we see with the establishment of these various chairs, of which the chair in Sussex is part one, is a continuation of something started in 2006 by the Australian millionaires Lee Leibman, who funded a new chair in Israeli studies at Monash University. She was worried then that Israel is studied in universities, and I quote her, through the narrow perspective of the Palestinian conflict. And as a way forward, she encouraged the creation of Israeli studies courses all over the world. And that initiative, that strategy, is one that has been promoted by the Wright Institute whose website reported in 2009, and I quote it, Ben-Gurion University professor David Newman describes how the growth of Israeli studies programs may serve as a constructive response to delegitimization and the attempted boycott of Israeli institutions on campuses across the world. In other words, the Hasbara strategy in academia was likewise developed at a 2009 conference convened by Israeli Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman and Likud Minister, Minister of the Knesset, Yuli and African Studies, of which I am a past graduate, the University of Manchester, where I am a past lecturer, as it happens. <laughs> they seem to be following me around. <laughs> um, there isn't one at the University of Sussex, at uh, the University of Brighton across the road here. Leeds University. All of these funded by the Peers Foundation, and then another at the University of Oxford, um, founded by the Stanley and Zev Lewis family. At SOAS, the posts are named Israeli Studies Post. At other universities, the names link Israel, uh, but they link it by making direct reference to Middle Eastern studies or Mediterranean studies. Here at the University of Sussex, the Yossi Harel Chair in modern Israeli studies is named after somebody who directly worked for Mossad as a provocateur and spy, who sought to escalate the conflict in Egypt during the Suez crisis, and who fought for the Haganah. Uh, and uh, you can follow this through. Now, this is not an argument against having a chair that specializes in the Middle East or specializes in that particular part of the Middle East that is covered by what is today called, in political terms, Israel, or having a chair that looks at the relationship between Israel and the, and the Palestinians, Israelis and Palestinians, or Israel and Palestine. It's not an argument against having such a chair. But it is an argument to say that in the circumstances that I have just described, this looks, at first blush, and, as, and since it was established, less like a dispassionate inquiry into what is going on and more like something that is divorced, distanced from academic scholarship and inquiry and much more like a propaganda exercise on behalf of one side of a perennial conflict in the Middle East. And under such circumstances, I think there is a serious question to be asked about the academic integrity of the process that established it that questions that need to be asked about what the purpose of the chair is, how it places itself in relation to the conflict to which I just referred, how the appointments are made and who qualifies and is disqualified. For instance, were it to be the case that I was a historian of the area, which I am not, but am well known for a certain hostility to Israel and to Zionism, were I to apply for the chair, which I won't do because I'm certainly not in my field of expertise, would I, by dint of my political position on the question of Israel, be debarred from it? 
If I was a Muslim, would I be debarred from it? More sharply, if I was a Palestinian, would I be debarred from it? And I find it hard to believe in the absence of categorical statements from the university and structures in place that would preclude that form of discrimination that a chair of, of Israeli studies in this institution, particularly one named in the way that it has been named, and I do wonder whether the University of Sussex and its august vice-chancellor knew what they were doing when they allowed a centre of research to be named after this man. I do ask that question. In the absence of those kinds of guarantees, I think that the suspicion that we all might have about the nature of this being a propaganda exercise on behalf of Israel rather than on a genuine academic exercise is a legitimate suspicion. And under those circumstances, I certainly would urge everybody, both here at the University of Brighton, in any other university where this kind of chair or research center is established, to ask those questions and get them asked at every single level, in your students' union, in your trade unions, in your faculty boards, in your academic boards, and even on the board of governors. What does each member of the board of governors think about this? What does each new member or existing member of the academic board, whether they were here at the time of the establishment of this chair or were not, what do they say to those who would put to them in the absence of the kinds of questions being answered that I posed at the beginning of this meeting, this university, if it is to have any scholarly activity, uh, integrity, should abolish this chair until those questions can be satisfactorily answered.